Hey folks, so here I am uh, doing a first video in a while, slightly different angle. Uh, this might look very different from what you're used to seeing when I do a video, but um, in reality, uh, I'm only a few feet away from my usual angle. I'm just not sitting at the computer, I've got my iPad in front of me instead. And I know there's a bit of glare on there, but uh, if I turn the light, I really need a certain amount of light here to see what I'm doing. And uh, I know it's creating glare behind me, despite the fact that it's New Year's Eve. Um, behind me is my, are my uh, lights that were all set up uh, for Halloween. And to me, it's still Halloween, even though it's December 31st. Um, so I still haven't taken down my Halloween decorations. Uh, my Halloween lights are on. I, I leave them up all year, to be honest. Um, with my little tiki heads and um, my various Halloween figures. One of the things hanging there is a, actually, they're about this big, a little group, little set of skeletons um, that uh, yeah, you really can't see them. Um, but they're, trust me, they're lights and they're hanging on the same, on the same string as the orange lights are on. And my tiki heads, those are my tiki heads. Um, so last minute, I thought I would do a video. I don't know how the sound of this is going to come out, uh, mainly because I'm um, doing this uh, a bit of a distance away. So I hope it's going to come out okay. Wanted to do a, a uh, year-end video. I haven't done much videos uh, in 2020. 2020 hasn't been a good year in general, to be honest, uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and the big one is a lot of musicians died. A lot. A lot of people died. And uh, usually you could probably, on any other year, you could probably do a year-end video and speak about all of the musicians that you liked. Not all of the musicians who died, but all the ones that particularly affected me or you as a person uh, in the course of the year. This year, there's so many musicians who died uh, that are people that I absolutely adore and have for for decades. Most of these musicians uh, I got into in the 1970s who passed away this year, and I can't even list all of them. Um, a couple that I don't have uh, anything to show by, uh, Ira Sullivan, who is a um, mainstream jazz uh, saxophone player and trumpeter, uh, Annie Ross, the singer from um, Lambert Hendricks and Ross, is another one. She had a pretty good long life. And some people looking over a list, uh, there's a few people that I was uh, unaware that passed away. And I'm only dealing here with a handful of my favorites. I want to make a short video. Um, so I'm, I'm skipping over and missing over a ton of people. Um, here's one guy that I wasn't aware of, uh, no mention of it in the news or anything, until I saw a list. Classical guitarist Julian Bream. Julian Bream passed away. Wasn't aware of that. I tried, I tried finding mostly, uh, mostly people I had vinyls by. Few I couldn't. Uh, some people I'm not going to talk a lot about because um, I don't want to do a 90 minute video. Uh, a big one, Lyle Mays. I wasn't even gonna. I wasn't even gonna mention Lyle because um, he was probably the best known musician out of all the ones I'm gonna show. But um, considering how shocking his passing was, because he he wasn't an old person and um, nobody knew that he had been ill at all. All they had known is he hadn't he hadn't been playing much. Um, probably some somebody that's a, this is a this guy's a big deal to me, but I don't think too many people really know him. Very experimental, electronic, for the most part, composer. Uh, I only found that after he died that he had been te he'd been teaching in colleges. A lot of these experimental uh, electronics guys they can't make a living doing this kind of stuff because their their record sales aren't going to be up there. Um, but uh, I found that after he passed away, that one of my big heroes, this guy Richard Teitelbaum. Experimental electronic composer. There's a couple, just a couple albums by him. Uh, you know, I didn't go digging out everything, 
most of these artists. I just dug out one or two albums I had. Uh, Richard Teitelbaum passed away. Turns out he was uh, he was an instructor at a college. I think it was in upstate New York. Um, so not not incredibly far from here. Somebody I'm not sure I even heard about at the time. Another guy. Um, another one of the Heath brothers. Unfortunately, um, saxophonist Jimmy Heath passed away this year. And uh, we lost Percy Heath, his brother, a number of years ago. And interestingly enough, I just happened to select this album. But um, on this uh, Heath Brothers album from the early 80s, uh, Stanley Cowell, who played with a lot of people, but he played with the Heath Brothers a lot as well. Uh, Stanley Cowell, the keyboardist, also passed away this year. And that was something that uh, I selected this album. And then I realized looking at the personnel on it, oh, Stanley Cowell passed away as well. Excellent, excellent jazz pianist. Um, very wide-ranging, too. Um, another one that shocked me and upset me, though he wasn't a, a, an incredibly young man, McCoy Tyner, the great jazz pianist. Uh, people know him, I guess, mostly with, you know, being the... This is one of my particular favorites, uh, Trident, this album Trident, which is just a... Uh, just a trio. Um... McCoy Tyner on piano. He also plays the Celeste on a few tracks, which I think is the only time he did it on record that I can find. And I really like that, um, the, the sound of that in a, in a trio with Ron Carter on bass and Elvin Jones on drums. So a hell of a band on this Trident album from 1975. Most people know him as the pianist with Coltrane, but man, I'd rather, I'd rather hear McCoy on his own as a leader. Um, another guy who passed away... Great saxophone player, Lee Konitz. Um, I selected this album, the IAI Festival, um, which is independent artists, uh, record label that uh, Paul Blay, who passed away, I think, did Paul, I don't think Paul Blay passed away this year. I think he passed away the previous year. Um, I can't keep track of how many people we've lost uh, just in recent times. Uh, Lee Konitz, another one that, you know, that passed away. Uh, this is one of my favorite albums. It's just a, a short little live performance um, with the various artists, four artists that recorded for the IAI label that was only around for a few years in the uh, late 70s. Um, but this album has uh, Bill Connors on it, Paul Blay on piano, Lee Conant and J Jimmy Guffrey on um, saxophones and flute. Uh, I love that album. Love that album. Uh, another guy. The last surviving member of the single best-selling uh, album in jazz history, Miles Davis' is Kind of Blue. This is the um, 50th anniversary edition of it. This is the album. It's not. It's, it, I, I love. Uh, I love the album. Don't get me wrong. It's not. It's by far not my favorite Miles Davis album. However, I have bought bought. Kind of Blue more times than any other album, um, simply because of the numbers of times it was reissued. Um, I bought it originally on LP. Uh, then when CDs came out, I bought the CD edition. Then a second CD edition came out with um, an extra track, a, a different version of one of the tracks, and I bought that. And then they came out with another edition on CD that had more alternate takes, so I bought that. Then they came out with another CD edition um, where they had corrected the speed of it. It turns out all the previous LP and CD editions, uh, the master had been cut at the wrong speed. So um, everything was slightly out of key uh, in terms of you couldn't play along with it because it was somewhere between you know the the you know the, the pitch of the keys. Um, so then they did that that edition. So I bought that, and then I bought this huge box. Um, which you, you, oh, this thing weighs like, I don't know, 50 pounds. It's a, a heavy box um, edition of, uh, of Kind of Blue. And then there's another version I have on CD, which is a dual disc, which I forgot to, I didn't pull that out. But um, the dual disc was sh very short-lived, but interesting. It was a uh, standard CD on one side, but they printed stuff on the other side of the CD instead of just having a label. And they would have videos, generally videos on there, short videos about the making of the album 
uh, interviewing anybody that may have been around, uh, such as engineers and musicians. So they have the dual disc of Kind of Blue, which if you're not going to go for that huge 50-pound box set thing, um, if you could find uh, some remaining copies of the dual disc, it's a format that never caught on, but um, I don't know why. I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. So Jimmy Cobb, the drummer um, on Kind of Blue, passed away. Uh, classic era of Miles Davis. Some of my favorite music came out of that era, that Jimmy Cobb was the drummer. Um, Paul Chambers would, would have been on bass at that time. Um, Bill Evans and Wynton Kelly were on piano, uh, alternating kind of through the years. Um, Coltrane was in and out of the band at that point. Um, I forget the name of the other saxophone player. Um, Cannonball Adderley was, was also one of the saxophone players. But, um, geez, there's another one, and I can't think of his name now, that played on the um, Friday and Saturday night at the Blackhawk, which is uh, another classic Miles album. Um, Jimmy Cobb had led his own bands for years. The last one, Jimmy's Jimmy Cobb's Mob, he led for a number of years. Uh, now we get to some big guys that really, really affected me. Um, a guy that's not so much known for... Uh, i got to flip through my records here. Oh, no. I don't believe that just happened. Hold on, because the vinyl fell behind the furniture. <laughs> Oh, man. And I can't even get it. I don't even know what album it was. Uh, hold, on, hold on. I got it. I got it. Ugh. I can't believe that happened. All right. So everything's out of order now. But am I going to do a retake? So a guy, my favorite drummer in the world, passed away, John Christensen. Um, more known as a somebody who played uh, in bands. Not so much a, you know, a, a solo career. Um he uh, played with Keith Jarrett in the 70s, uh, late 70s. I think it spilled into the early 80s, but also Ralph Towner's Solstice, one of his, his better known albums um, that he played on. Uh, certainly one of, uh, one of Ralph Towner's most loved albums. Here's the Jan Garbrick Bobo Stenson Quartet album that John played drums on. Uh, he was the original drummer for Eberhard Weber's Colors Group. Played on the Yellow Fields album. Uh, and so didn't do, I think he's only got two, two albums um, that actually came out with his name on them. He was in a group where he was an equal member and, and did some writing for the group called Mescalero, uh, who did, an, who did um, I only have one of their CDs. The other ones are out of print. Very hard to get. Uh, even though they're recorded for ECM, ECM has not kept them in print. Mescalero is a great band, by the way, um, with Harold Anderson on bass. And here's a couple examples. The only two examples I know of where an album actually came out under John Christensen's name, and that's a uh, the Rarum compilation selected recordings, which is uh, came under John Christensen's name, even though these are just selections that John made himself of some of his favorite work for the ECM label, supporting other musicians. So none of these were actual John Christensen solo albums. It's just John Christensen playing with Keith Jarrett and Ralph Towner and Terry Ripdell, uh, Eberhard Weber, people like that. The only real album that I ever saw came out with his name on it was this duo album with Dino Saluzzi, the Bandonian player. Came out 2005, I think it is. Uh, and that's this, which I only bought because I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the Bandonian as an instrument. But it's interesting because it's just a duo. It's just a duet with the Bandonian player, Dino Saluzzi, and John Christensen on drums. That's a real interesting combination. It's got my favorite drummer, so I had to get it. Uh, another guy that I just found out that died that certainly wouldn't make the news because I don't think he was all that well known. Uh, a guy named uh, Jamie Merritt, who was a bass player. Probably, probably best known um, for playing with this guy, Max Roach. I don't think there's a picture of Jamie in here. No, there's no picture of Jamie in here. Uh, but this is my, what I call Max. I did, a, I, I, one time I did a video on this album, Max Roach Drums Unlimited, which was recorded in the late 60s. And to this day, I refer to it as my Christmas Eve album 
because one year in the early early 1980s before the uh before the cd era came along um it was kind of like a not great time in my life and on christmas eve i decided last thing man it was it was like late afternoon maybe even like 5 p.m 4 or 5 p.m so stores were starting to shut down and i was driving around and i decided to stop in a record store uh, not in a mall just a standalone record store before they closed i don't think anybody was in it and i just decided you know i'm gonna treat myself it's christmas eve i'm feeling kind of down and i i just didn't know anything about this album didn't know who played on it and i just said damn you know that looks interesting you know late i could tell from the cover and the and the styles and everything that it was a late 60s album jamie merritt plays bass on it he passed away this year and it's one of my uh one of my favorite Max Roach albums. One of the reasons why it's got, uh, I think, like three, three short drum solos on it. Three short pieces written just for solo drums. And um, I couldn't, interestingly, I couldn't see any of the titles of the songs on it because the record was sealed. And they didn't list any of the songs on there. And I bought this Christmas Eve and I go home and I open it up. And one of the tracks, interestingly enough, is called In the Red... A Christmas Carol and I thought wow that's really weird serendipity that uh, coincidence that I bought that on Christmas Eve and it was the only album I, I bought that that night that I walked out with and uh, I didn't even know if I was gonna like it if it was any good and um, it turned out it's a great album which of course I've bought on CD now uh, two, two bit two other guys John Christensen was my favorite drummer one of my favorite bass players in the world passed away, um, Gary Peacock. I'm just going to show two of his albums, two of my favorite albums. Um, Voices from the Past, which is interesting because it's um, Gary Peacock on bass, Jack DeJanet on drums, and two horn players. No harmonic instrument, no guitar, no piano. Um and it's very interesting, the, and they don't think they do any overdubs either, so it's just the two horns, bass, and drums. Gary Peacock recorded a lot of piano trio albums, piano, bass, and drums. To me, when he went outside that area, it was his more interesting stuff. And he actually did two albums like this. He did two albums with uh, a lineup of two horns, bass, and drums. It's one of my favorites, but my very favorite, and the only time he ever did this, December Poems. I love this album. Um, for the most part, Gary Peacock solo. Um, Jan Garbrick plays saxophone on two of the tracks on here, but the rest of it is just Gary Peacock solo bass. Recorded December 1977, which was a big year personally for me in my life. Um and uh it's obviously his most sparse album being just bass solos don't recall there being any overdubbing either and if there is it may, it's it's only on maybe one track um so it, it's going to be a weird experience listening to this now because i've been listening to this album since 1978 and you know every time i put it on i just had the knowledge that gary peacock was still around still alive and and now um now he's not and especially with a, a solo setting a solo album for the most part like i said john garbrick does play sax on two tracks but on the rest of the album uh, gary peacock was the only musician creating this so you know i always thought well, if i could ever interview or speak to gary peacock this would be the album that I would ask the most questions about. He wasn't known for it. He didn't go out and do uh, solo bass albums. He never did solo bass performances, unlike another one of my favorite musicians who thankfully is still with us, because in the past five years, most of my favorite musicians have passed away. Um, but um, Bar Phillips, another bass player, uh, who has done also solo bass albums, um, like I said, who's thankfully still with us, did a lot of live performances of solo bass. Gary Peacock never did, to the best of my knowledge. So, you know, that's why this particular album 
which sounds really nice on CD because, you know, it's it's a very quiet album. Um, that's why this album is, is very unique. And it's a, it's it's going to be a weird listening experience listening to it now, knowing that he passed away. Uh, the last guy, certainly not the least, actually probably my favorite, one of my favorites. Um, I, I only picked one album to show. I could show a million things. Harold Budd, who passed away very recently. Um... Harold Budd, the keyboard player, synthesist, one of the creators of um, ambient music, minimalist music, passed away uh, from COVID, of all things. Um, and he had been very active right up until the end. So uh, despite his age, and I think he was in his early 80s, um, despite his age, he um, was not in declining health at all. He was very active recording in the last five years, decade or so. Um, at one time, he, he did claim to have stopped recording, but um, he retired from recording, but that didn't last very long at all. I don't even know if that lasted a full year. And that was uh, a number of years ago, maybe about 10 years ago now. After that point, he started recording again, and he just never, he was on full-fledged, hard to even keep up with his album releases, to be honest. So that was a shock. Harold... All these guys were a shock passing away to me. Harold Budd, because he was so uh, prolific in recent times, that was a big, big, big surprise to me. And the guy that I discovered in about, I want to say 1978, and I never have stopped listening to him since then. So I just wanted to pay homage to uh, just a few, not even all of the guys that I liked that passed away in the last year. Uh, forget about like the last five years and do a video would be nine hours long. Um, but I wanted to say something about these guys and appreciation for their work and how for me it's going to be um, difficult and a totally different experience now listening to their music at this stage uh, now that they've passed. But um, such is life, I guess. So if you've all gotten over your shock that I did another video, um, happy new year to everybody. Let's all hope that, uh, 2021 is better. It's almost gotta be better. Um, and that's about all I have to say. So take care everybody and hope you're all doing well and I'll come back and do another video at some point.